we need to avoid, as physicists, falling into the trap of producing numbers that are meaningless because we've not considered the uncertainties associated with them, the potential errors associated with them. Okay, so that's essentially what we're going to deal with um, through the lecture today. Now, this top statement is really important. Uh, I've stressed already when we've been talking about worked examples and so on, the need always to put units down, that a number on its own is meaningless. Okay? There is another number that you're going to need to write down as well when you're talking about experimental work, the results of experimental work, and that's an uncertainty associated with the number. You will never, ever, ever in your entire professional careers measure something experimentally to absolute precision so that the uncertainty associated with it is zero. Right? Let me know if you can conceive of an experiment where that is not true. So in all of the results that you present out of <coughs> your lab work, out of research projects that you do later on, in your careers in future, you are going to need to consider carefully what the uncertainty is in association with, your, uh, with the number that you're suggesting is the answer. Right, and we're just going to make a beginning on that. Um, you, you know, in the first couple of years, you'll be with us. After that, you know, this can be developed a lot more, um, a lot more seriously. <coughs> so you're going to have a number, which is your answer, but your answer may be a little bit to either side of that number. Right? You cannot rule out that it will be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, whatever it might be. Right, you do not have the data that allows you to do that. That's essentially the statement that's being made here. Um, but we, we're not going to go overboard, or at least in the next couple of years, we're not going to go overboard on this. What we're going to ask you to do is to produce a reasonable estimate of the error. This is an error, after all. Right, if we get too carried away with this, we're going to have our answer, an error associated with that answer, and an error associated with our error, Right, you can see this is going to regress infinitely if we're not careful. So we're just going to ask you for a reasonable estimate of the error associated with your results. And I'm only going to talk about random uncertainties. Right, that's really all you're going to be asked to consider uh, in a quantitative sense. So associated <coughs> with numbers. All right. Um, there is another sort of error which is called a systematic error. Right, now systematic errors are really, really important, and you may well need to think about those, discuss those uh, in your lab reports, but in terms of the numerical manipulation of numbers, we're going to focus on random errors. All right? But I should just tell you what the difference between those two things is. Um, if we're measuring length, for instance, I mean, let's take this meter rule as you know, our measuring stick for whatever it is we're doing. Uh, a random error is if I give this ruler to you know all 45 of you, however many are present, uh, and I ask you to measure the width of this bench, we'll come out with <coughs> all sorts of numbers that will centre around um, what is the true in quotes width of this bench. All right? Some people will give it a millimetre or so to either side. I'm sure. All right, so there'll be a whole bunch of numbers uh, and there'll be a little bit of variation in that. That is random. Right? That's what we call a random error. Because one measurement is not correlated with another. Right? Because it's been each of you in turn that's produced that data. They're completely independent, these measurements of one another. That's what makes it random. A systematic error would be if the manufacturer of this ruler had got it wrong. So if this wasn't a one metre ruler, but actually if it was stretched by 2%, it was actually uh, 102 centimetres long instead of 100 centimetres long. Right? So everybody's measurement will be wrong because of that systematic error. <coughs> you would have no chance of making uh, an accurate measurement because your measuring device is wrong in some sense. Okay? Now that's going to pertain in some of your experiments, as I've said already, 
but it's not something we can consider in a, in a numerical sense. Uh, it's just something you would need to write a cautionary sentence about when you came to write up your experiment. And to suggest, suggest ways, for instance, that it might be uh, mitigated against. Okay, so we're only going to look at random errors. Um, there is a textbook. Um, there's actually, or used to be, I think there still is a copy of this in the lab anyway. Uh, so if you want to look up more detail or remind yourselves of this, that, and the other, then you can go and see it. Uh, it's in the library as well. It's actually also relatively cheap if you wanted to buy a copy for yourself. Uh, but it goes way beyond uh, anything that you'll be asked to do this year or next. Right? So there's a lot of stuff in there that would take you, well, actually all the way through to a PhD if you were going to get into research. Um, so it's not a book I would recommend in the sense of go out and buy it. Um, <coughs> you make absolutely certain you get a copy out of the library and have a look at it. It's just something there in the background should you need it. Okay. All right, so let's dive in. Some of these things you're going to be relatively familiar with, I'm sure, and that's okay. Uh, forgive me for repeating what you already know, but I need to be certain that we're going to be talking the same language, and that <coughs> includes um, the use of nomenclature. Now, let me just search out my laser pointer in here somewhere. So the first thing we need to think about is the mean. So let's return to our example. You've made independent measurements of the width of this bench using the ruler. <coughs> so we've got, whatever it is, 45 data points, 45 values of a width. If I wanted to find the mean that you come up with from this, then we'd simply add all of your individual measurements together and divide by 45. Right? That's not going to shock anybody. <coughs> That's the mean. <coughs> but this is the notation that we're going to use, and I'm not sure whether you've come across uh, these angular uh, brackets before or not. Anyone seen them before? All right, a couple have. But that's a very common nomenclature that you'll find in textbooks all over the place for a mean. Okay, there is another variant that you will see in some places. So if our variable is x still, X with a bar over the top, right? Is another shorthand for me. They both refer to exactly the same thing. So as I say, all we've done is add up all our values in our example up to 45. So first one of you to do a measurement through to the 45th one of you that did the measurement and then divide by the total number of those measurements. So that's our me. So if you've done repeat measurements in your lab of something or other and you will always seek to do repeat measurements very bad scientific practice if you didn't um, then that's your primary number right answer equals it'll be that mean value right and what we now need to talk about is what's the uncertainty on that so it will be x plus or minus something or other Okay, now the plus or minus that we're going to focus on, and there are different ways of doing this, all right? This is just the one that we're going to use. It's a very common method, but it's the one that you're going to find throughout this year and next. It's going to cover everything <coughs> that you need to worry about. It's this thing called the root mean square deviation. And everything is in the label. It is the square root of the mean of the square deviation. <laughs> right? So let's try and unpack it as we go. So up here to produce our mean look, we added all the values together and divided by n. What we're going to do here <coughs> is to say, well look, for each of the values, so each 45, so I here is going to vary between 1 and in our example 45. <coughs> Have you seen this symbol before? Anyone not? It just means sum of. All right. <coughs> so in our example here, this means we're going to add up everything to the right <coughs> of this for all values 
between one and in our example the four. <coughs> Alright, so that would mean if I break this down a little bit more because I saw one or two puzzle traces, let's just take the bracket, alright? This is the bit that we're interested in. It would be x1 minus our mean value of x uh, squared plus x2 minus our mean of x squared plus all the way through to the end one, which is xn, so x45 in our example minus the average squared. All right, it just means the sum of. So we're adding all of those different things up. And then again, we're dividing by n. So it's the mean of this thing called the square deviation. We've added them all up, and we've divided by the number of them. So by definition, that's a mean. And then we're just taking the square root again. And this final thing over here, sigma, is what we call the root mean square deviation. Now, we've begged lots of questions in here, which we now need to think about a little bit further. Why, for instance, have we gone through this apparently laborious process of taking the difference from our mean, squaring it, and then eventually taking a square root? it might seem a redundant process. Um, let's try and sketch out, sketch this out um, um, graphically if I can think of a way of doing it. Um, okay. <coughs> let's actually stick with our example, shall we? So this is N. Right, so this is numbers all the way between 1 and 45 for you of measuring the width of the bench. So this is the width of the bench up here. So this is the thing that we're talking about as x. <coughs> and there's some mean value right, that we can determine just by going through that process at the top of the slide. Okay, so the mean value runs along. <coughs> but your individual measurements are going to vary a little bit from there. All right, so for each of you doing your uh, measurement, we're going to have you know data points all over the place, around and on that mean. Yeah. So what have we done? We've said, let's take the first one, we've said we're going to measure the difference <coughs> between the mean and our actual measured value from the first person to do it. That gap there. And then we're going to square it. And then we're going to add it to the square of that distance. Right? And do exactly the same process all the way along for all our 45 measurements. And then we're going to produce a mean of those and take the square root again. Now, my question is why have we gone through this process of squaring the difference between our individual data points and the mean? Because, you're right, because. What is your explanation? Oh, for that? The, the mean is going to be in the middle, so the distance yeah. between them. Absolutely. So it would have to be zero. If we just added that positive length to that negative length to that positive length to that negative length, by definition, because of how we've produced our mean, the final result, the summation of those things, would be zero. So we have to square it so that we always get a positive number that we can add up. So why would you not use something like a modulus function? You could do that. And there are, and there are ways of producing an uncertainty using that. <coughs> this is a much more commonly adopted approach. Yeah? So we have to square it to make sure that we don't get, in all cases, a root mean square deviation which is zero. 
we need a sigma that's positive. <coughs> so that's the reason for squaring it. So we square it, we then produce an average of that square, and then we take the square root. All right, because if this is length, <coughs> this is in meters, all right, we've got to take the square root at the end because otherwise we're going to end up with uh, length squared in our uncertainty. So we'd have an answer that's a certain length, plus or minus a certain number of square meters, which is obviously a nonsense. So we've got, to, we've got to do that final bit of taking the square root again to get it back into the right units. Yes? So we would end up <coughs> with our width if we were doing this as a writing down our result from the lab experiment, uh, the width is equal to whatever the number was that we got as our mean, uh, plus or minus the root mean squared deviation on x. Right? And that will be in meters. So there is the full recording of your result from your lab experiment. Okay? You're going to lose out if you don't put the units in, but you're going to lose out probably more, at least as much, by not putting in your uncertainty. Yeah? Uh, when you square root it, because it's got a negative and a positive root. Uh, no, it won't. Which? You've added a whole lot of positive numbers up. Yeah. All right? Because by definition, that top line is a positive number now because we've squared everything. We've divided it by a positive number. So we've got a positive number inside the bracket. And all we're going to do is take the square root of that positive number. Yeah? Yeah, but it has a negative root as well. In what way does it have? Minus 2 squared is 4. Yeah, but we're never going to get minus 2 squared. Okay. okay. That's the whole point of taking yeah. the square. The minus will become a positive. <coughs> okay. Yeah? Is anyone else got a question? Okay, all right. So let's, uh, let's move on. We can show, not that we're going to do it now, but <coughs> if we define our root mean square deviation you'll see it written down as RMS deviation quite often, or just written down as sigma, right? just using this symbol. If we define it in this way, then it can be proven, and as I say, I'm not going to do it with you now, because um, it involves quite a lot of calculus, that our result has a probability of 68% being at that value, plus or minus sigma. All right. Now, what that is going to look like graphically, if I show you that on the board again, with the same data set, but let's plot it in a slightly different way. Let's now put our measurement of the width of the bench for the x-axis. And instead, up here, uh, we'll plot something that statisticians have called <coughs> frequency. So, here's our mean value. Right? And we've made so many measurements at the mean, so many beyond it, so many below it. Yeah? But it may, I mean, I don't know. It's, this, is, this is just off the top of my head. But, you know, maybe a dozen of you measured precisely at the mean. And eight of you measured at the mean plus a millimetre. Another eight of you measured at the mean minus a millimetre. And maybe six of you measured plus two <coughs> millimetres or minus two millimetres. <coughs> All right? So the number of you getting a certain measurement is what we refer to as the frequency. So if we plot this out, we'll end up with... Um, you wouldn't plot it out this way for a mere 45 measurements, but we'll do it anyway. You'll end up with a distribution, something like that. Right? If it's a properly random distribution, it will be a curve called a Gaussian. So it's, it's symmetrical about the middle. 
essentially what that is. So here's our mean value. And our sigma value refers to the width of that peak, basically. It's a measure of the width of that distribution. So what we're quoting is that, I'll find another colour, that between <coughs> plus or minus sigma, so there and say there, what we're saying is that 68% of all the values that we measured will fall in that window. There is a small probability in total 32% <coughs> that might be outside it. Alright, so those of you who are following the um, discovery of the Higgs boson will have heard them talking about the five signal levels. Yes? Remember hearing about that? That is their test of the reliability of the data. They haven't just taken one sigma either side of the mean, they've gone out five times that to either side. So the probability that the result actually falls outside that bound is actually <coughs> now really, really, really small. Yeah? But what you're doing in terms of your lab experiments, plus or minus one sigma is entirely <coughs> sufficient. The best I get my research students to do on, on the sort of stuff they're doing is two or three sigma. And we're already talking about 99.5% of the values falling between those values. And that's enough for the sort of research that we do. Okay, so this stuff is important and it's going to carry through your entire professional lives at one degree of... Um, sophistication or another but the general principle rem will remain the same it's always a mean value plus or minus um, an uncertainty and for this year and next your uncertainty is going to be plus or minus sigma ok good um, now there's another quantity right down at the bottom of the slide there that we need to think about because <coughs> What we've done so far is really at the simple end <coughs> of the spectrum. We haven't actually talked about combining these things. So what if your final answer is, is, comes out of an equation? You've actually had to measure three different things. They've got three different errors associated with them, and you need to put them into an equation to get your final answer. So what's the error on the final answer? That's a much more common scenario that you're going to be faced. So we do need to move on and make something a little bit more sophisticated happen here. So the fractional error is something that we're going to need to use a lot. So it's our RMS deviation <coughs> at the top divided by the mean. <coughs> so it's saying what fraction of the mean is <coughs> our uncertainty, our sigma value. Yeah? Right, so now we get to this point where we can actually put these things together. And I'll show you a, an example of this in a slide or two's time. So if we need to combine uncertainties, <coughs> then uh, we're going to have a fairly straightforward set of rules that you can find. And again, there's a lot of mathematics behind this that you, will, uh, you may come across later on, but it's, it's not needed now. Um, this sort of recipe book will be entirely adequate for what you want uh, to do. So if we've got two things that are added or subtracted, so your final answer is A plus B, both of which you've measured, both of which have sigma values associated with them. Yeah? Um, then we're going to add the square of the uncertainties and then take the square root. So what does that mean? It means we've got <coughs> sigma associated with A, <coughs> sigma associated with B. We're going to square both of them. We're going to add that, those two squares together, and then we're going to take the square root. All right, so let me try and sketch this up uh, on the board. Just 
just to show you what this means. So let's go back to what I um, suggested was our result. Right. So here's our theoretical equation. Let's see we're after. <coughs> so what we've measured <coughs> is a mean value of a plus or minus some value of sigma. And we've measured a mean value of b and its plus or minus another sigma value. Yeah? What we want out of this is that. So it's getting from one to the other that we now need to think about. That's easy. It's just that plus that. Right? That's straightforward. This thing is the thing that we need to work a little bit harder at. So what we're going to do is essentially produce our sigma value for C from that. is the way you would combine your uncertainties. Now what's happened here, there's a significance behind squaring these again. This is not because we've got to get rid of anything that's negative, because the sigmas are all going to be positive. Right? They're all positive numbers. What this does is to make absolutely certain that the biggest single contributor to our final uncertainty is given due weight. All right, so let's put in a numerical example here. Let's just say that that <coughs> sigma value is 1, uh, that sigma <coughs> value is 2. Trivial example. All right, if we add the squares, what this ensures is that we're going to get 1 plus 4. So in other words, sigma c would then be the square root of 5. That would be the number that would go in up there. Right, you can see what's happened now. We've got a much bigger uncertainty in this measurement and we've made sure that that is reflected in our final answer. The dominant source of our final error is the error that we had on B. That's what it does in practice. Okay? So we're going to add the squares of our errors and then take the square root. Now, that's if things are um, added together. If they're multiplied or divided, uh, then uh, it's actually simpler in a way. If they're multiplied or divided, we just add together the <coughs> fractional errors. <coughs> okay, so let's, our equation now is somewhat different. Uh, C is equal to A <coughs> times K. Again, what we want is a mean value of C <coughs> plus or minus some sigma value. So what we're going to do in this case um, is to say that uh, the fractional error on C <coughs> is equal to the sum of the fractional error on A plus the fractional error on B. That will be exactly the same thing if <coughs> our equation is that. Right? So whether it's <coughs> by or divided we would just add the fractional elements. 
right? <coughs> I should have said above, I suppose, if our equation was C equals A minus B, same thing applies. We just add the squares and take the square root. Yeah? So adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Um, but there's only two rules to choose between them. And you just pick which one's appropriate. Or combine them, all right? If our equation was C equals A plus B divided by D, then you've got a combination of these things. You'd have to do the A, uh, sorry, you'd have to do the C over D first and then add the A as a separate stage. Okay? Um, all right, now the other thing that might happen, and I put this right at the bottom of the slide, uh, is that our equation might be multiplied by something, all right? It might be C equals A plus B in brackets, all multiplied by three. So, well, all you do is simply scale up your uncertainty by a factor of three as well. All right, so that just multiplies straight through, if it's a constant like that. <coughs> All right, so let's have an example. This is an equation we will get to by the end of this term in pH 6 <coughs> It's the perfect gas equation, and it gives us a way, for instance, as expressed up there, um, if we were measuring, able to measure pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas, uh, it would tell us what the <coughs> gas constant is. Okay? And there's a constant in there, right? I've thrown a constant in as well. Number of moles in. All right, so we've made repeat measurements of pressure, volume, and temperature. So we've got a mean <coughs> of PV and T, and we've got three sigmas, one for each of them as well. Yeah? So... What is going to be the <coughs> uncertainty in the gas constant? Anyone care to be brave enough to tell me what this will look like? Sorry? Go on, be brave. Well, we've measured pressure, <coughs> temperature, and volume. Yeah. <coughs> Would you have to do P over T, the uncertainty of that one, and then do V over T as well? And then no, no, out. actually it's easier. Even easier than that. You would simply, because P, V, and T are all either multiplied or divided, then you just add the fractional errors. So it's the fractional error in P, plus the fractional error in V, plus the fractional error in T, multiplied by the number of moles, so that's just a numerical constant, N, <coughs> is now equal to your fractional error in R. Yeah? So it's just following the rules that we had on the previous slide. you're unlikely to get equations that are more complicated than that. So you should be okay with this. But it's, you know, it might be worth going away and just sort of thinking it through. Um, but let's have a look at something where we've got multiplication and addition. So the equation of a straight line is a good example of that. Right? You can write the equation of a straight line just as uh, y equals the gradient times the x value plus the intercept. y equals mx plus c. I'm guessing all of you have come across this in one <coughs> shape or form before. Okay, so what we're going to measure experimentally is x and y. For any given value of x, that we measure, set up, determine, whatever it is, what is the value of y that we get. And we're going to repeat that up two times. So we're going to have mean x's and mean y's and a sigma with x and a sigma with y. Yeah? 
And what's often required, I mean, this is actually a fairly common experiment to do, I would, I would suggest, uh, is to determine the gradient of the straight line. Right, as we'll see next term, we can time the swing of a pendulum in order to produce the value for the acceleration due to gravity. That involves plotting the square of the period of the pendulum, in other words, how long it takes to do a complete cycle, against the length of the piece of string uh, that's defining the length of your pendulum. And the gradient of the line you get is G, is the acceleration due to gravity. Or at least it's, apart from a factor of 4 pi, uh, it's G. Yeah? So it's, a, it's actually a relatively common thing to do. In fact, that was the original way that people determined what G was um, by timing a pendulum. Um, and in fact, then taking it up a mountain and showing that G was somewhat lower at the top of the mountain compared to at the bottom of the mountain, simply because you're further away from the Earth's centre. Right? This is a sensitive enough measurement to do that. Anyway, I digress, as I often do. Um, this is our problem then. We've got an equation of a straight line, y equals mx plus c, and what we want is m. What we've got is a mean value of y, uh, you know, for every data point, and we've got a sigma value for y, we've got mean values of x, <coughs> and sigma values for x, and so on, right? Because we've done this experiment 15 times. Well, actually, we're going to need to rearrange this to find m, aren't we? So this will be y minus c um, sorry. <coughs> so you're going to adopt the same approach here. Uh, There's a division here, so it's the multiplication and division rules. There's a subtraction here. Right? I should have said we've measured C, of course. And we've got a that as well. So probably the easiest way of doing this is actually to do Y over X minus C over X. That's the easiest way of thinking about it. And then we can combine fractional errors here. We can combine fractional errors here, <coughs> and we can take the square of the result here plus the square of the result here, and then take the square root, and that will actually give us then our final error. Right? So break it down into little bits. Would it matter yeah. to the uh, the addition of y plus c, and then took the uh, fractional error of that result? So you do a yeah square and then a square root up here. Yeah, and then add it to the other one. I've never worked it through. So if you want to try it, do. I suspect, I hope, it will come out to the same thing. Okay? So there's, there's nothing else you can get. Things are either going to be multiplied and divided, added or subtracted, or multiplied by a constant. There is nothing else that you can possibly get and face uh, in, your, in your lab work. So it's just going to be an application, a logical application of these rules. And you'll get a, uh, a lot of help in the labs doing this, all right? Because this is, this is recognized as an important skill that you've got to master. <coughs> so it's going to be, you know, demonstrators in the lab, postgraduate students and so on, who will be able to talk you through this stuff in real time, as it were, while you're sitting there with your calculator at the bench. All right, so take advantage of them, use them, and make sure this is a skill that you can actually put into practice. And that is the best way of doing it, right? With your data that you need to write <coughs> and present. There's, you know, that's the best motivation for getting sorted on how to produce these uncertainties. All, right, all I'm doing is giving you the framework, giving the rules. Now, there's a sort of pragmatic approach, <coughs> which is what's at the bottom of the slide here, um, in terms of handling um, uh, 
graphs that you might produce in your lab experiment. So let's go back to that swing of the pendulum thing. <coughs> um, this is jumping ahead to next term a little bit, but that's the equation for the time period of the swing of our pendulum. It's the length of the bit of string divided by the acceleration due to gravity, the square root of that multiplied by 2 pi. <coughs> So we can rearrange that, because actually if we want to find this, we've got to get this out of the fraction. So we'll square both sides of this to get rid of the square root, and then we'll multiply and divide here and there. Um, and we'll end up with an equation that shows us that if we plot t squared against L, we expect to get a straight line. <coughs> Yeah? Now you'll do these measurements and you'll get right, data points somewhere around the vicinity of that line, I'm sure. <coughs> right, so what's acceptable, certainly this year and mostly next year, uh, if you put this data into Microsoft Excel, there is a function that will tell you precisely what the gradient is and what the uncertainty on that gradient is. It will work out the root mean square deviation for you. All right, But you might want, not want to do that. So it's actually also acceptable at this stage to say, well, you know, I could mm, relatively easily draw a line there. I could also <coughs> relatively easily draw a line there. So you get a maximum gradient and a minimum gradient, basically, and you use that as an estimation of m plus or minus something. Okay, that will be acceptable this year. As I say, when you get more confident about putting your data into things like Excel, and I wouldn't recommend doing it too early because, you know, using black boxes is dangerous. You need to know what Excel does before you do that sort of stuff. Um, then I would suggest using this route. Okay, so that's everything I needed to say about error analysis in the lab. And bang on time, look at that. Um, so.